So first of all, welcome to this, welcome to this Topics in Tech series uh, presentation sponsored by the Sandbox. And uh, all of you are here, I assume, because you're in CS100 and your professor made you come, but hopefully it won't be too painful. <laughs> Please remember that I, you probably need to take a picture while you're here to prove that you're here. Um, so at some point, take a, take a selfie with Paul. Go stand up and do the thing with your, do the thing with your phones you have it to write up, to, to include your report. Don't forget to do that. Um, there are lots of different presentations, as you may have seen on the, on the list when you signed up to come to this one. And I encourage you to come to as many of them as you want. Uh, we've been able to do our their first choices because we've got some larger, some, some smaller spaces. Next Wednesday, next Wednesday, I'll highlight that one. It's really cool. Um, the person who's speaking is Professor Ed Fredkin. I met him at MIT. He's, he was a former director. He's retired now. He's a former director of the AI lab at MIT. He has a patent on using microcomputers for self for uh, car navigation, and he's a big Tesla fan. And he's going to come and talk about the technology and the business of self-driving cars. And that's going to be wilder. And so a little closer than here if you're up on upper, upper campus. That's going to be wilder. And at the end of his presentation, he and his wife and I think. Another friend of theirs are all bringing their, their Model X, Model E, and a Model Y, and they're making Model S. They're bringing all these, uh, they're bringing all their cars to campus, and basically they're going to give people who want to take pictures uh, in and around their, their cars afterward, and also they're going to give people rides around Beaver Street. If you've never been in a Tesla before, I highly recommend it because you, you can see all the technology gadgets that they're, that they're going to talk about inside the car on work. And last time I was in it, they went from zero to like 60 on Beaver Street. You know, very short time of time. So <laughs> it's, it's like going on a roller coaster. So if you're if you're on next Wednesday, you can join us for that one. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones online and in person throughout the semester. Everybody good? Are we comfortable? You guys online okay? Yes. And so our, our presenter today is Paul Feldman. Paul works at Akamai. Paul was in a class I taught here at Bentley many years ago. Um, it was one of the first web development courses that that um, we taught here about me. It was a summer. And it's been cool. We've stayed in touch ever since. And it's glad to, we're glad to welcome back to talk about techno skills that you could use uh, as you start as you, to, in your careers. Awesome. Awesome. So I assume people can see the video here. Okay, great. So as Mark said, I'm Paul Feldman. Um, my title at Akamai is I'm a senior director of engineering. Uh, I work for a company called Akamai Technologies. Has anybody heard of Akamai Technologies? No? Um, guarantee you that if you've been on the internet today that you've probably used Akamai without even knowing it. Many of the most popular websites, and we'll get into it in a little bit, um, use Akamai. And it's a, a pretty innovative place, a pretty um, technical, um, focused place, a very engineering focused place, and um, it's just a great company um, to work for. So I'm very fortunate. Um, but I got my journey, um, as Mark had said, here at Bentley um, in the technology space. And I want to share a little bit about that journey with you. Um, so without further ado, I'll get started. So what do I do at Akamai? I mentioned that Akamai um, powers a lot of the internet that you use every single day. Uh, I am not an engineer that is working on our core product or our core platform at Akamai. What I do is I support sales and marketing business functions. Sales and marketers use software in everything that they do and in fact, that world, the go to market world in terms of how people sell, um, find, you know, uh, sort of raise the awareness that they even have a problem. Um, many of the marketers, um, many of the salespeople rely on technology to do their job. And so everything that I do at Akamai is about enabling sales and marketers to do their job to sell and to market Akamai. So another way to think about it is that I've got a team of people who uh, support a business process, everything from awareness of Akamai to
to demand, demanding it, to selling it. And as soon as there's a, a, a contract with you know, an, a, another company, that's when my world ends. So another way to think about it is that I support our public website. I support our marketing automation software. I support our um, customer relationship database. And there's a whole host of applications that um, are there um, that my team supports. I um, have a team of folks geographically dispersed. Um, they are, consist of people who are software developers, um, business systems analysts, and project managers. So uh, kind of a show of hands, does the people, are people aware of business systems analysts? Do they, do you understand what that is when I say that? No? So think of a business systems analyst as somebody who is not a business analyst. So that word will be, is sometimes confused. Um, sometimes a business analyst would be looking at the business, analyzing the business. That's not what a BSA does, a business systems analyst. A business systems analyst is where I came up from, and that's where I started my career. And basically, it sits between the business folks who are, you know, in marketing, in sales, uh, who have a business problem where they want technology to solve that problem. I sit in the middle and work with engineers to understand what the business problem is, understand what the what the actual uh, issue is, what the opportunity is, and help to translate that need into um, some sort of requirements that can be handed off to a software engineer and be developed against. Does that make sense? So for me, technology is something that's very, very important, but understanding the business is also important. And so, you know, for those of you who are not sure where to go, you know, getting pressure in terms of going towards technology, going towards some line of business because, you know, mom and dad or a friend is saying, hey, you should go and do these things. I sit right in between. And that's pretty much the, the moral of, you know, the, the summary of my talk today is there are opportunities out there for people um, to do well out in the world, in the job market, um, who have a multitude of skills. And those multitude of skills can come together and create value for people. And so, you know, when I was thinking about, um, you know, what, what, how to talk about my career journey, because it's, it's all over the place and we'll get there in, in a moment. You know, I was thinking, what, what, how can I explain this to people? Like, how can I explain the journey that I was on and how all of these different skills come together to create value out in the job market? And, you know, it, it's not easy. Um, my story won't, you know, I wouldn't repeat my story, meaning if I was back at Bentley and I did exactly what I did, it, you know, the outcome wouldn't be the same. So I'm not here to tell you to follow my journey. Um, I'm here to tell you, follow yours and follow your passion and figure out what that is. Um, you know, as I understand it, many of you are first year, second year students. Okay, great. Well, you're welcome to Bentley. Um, I remember being in, you know, where you are. And my goal today is really to think about, to have you think about a framework on how you should think about your unique skill set and how you can create value and how you can get the most out of your education here. So one of the things that I'm very passionate about is my children. And this took a very, very long time for me to sort of appreciate like what gives me pleasure? What, why am I here? Um, I work, I love Akamai. It's a wonderful place. I love the people I work with, but at the end of the day, I'm here to think about something bigger and broader and that's my family. Um, Akamai has given me an opportunity to focus on the things that I love to do intellectually and also to enable me to create value so that I can do the things that I like to do personally. Um, skiing, 
is something that I absolutely love. Ski racing is something that I absolutely love. And these are my, my twins. Uh, and I also love to travel. And so that gives me energy to work and to grow and to evolve. And so one of the things as you start your journey here that you should be thinking about is what is it that gives you passion? What is it that allows you to get up in, in the morning and be happy? We're at one. <laughs> and um, that's really key because that's fundamentally what, um, why we're here, why we're working. Um, oops. So I'd like to talk a little bit about Akamai, but before I do, um, kind of show of hands, like are, are, are people leaning towards technology? Do they have any idea? Okay, a couple of you. I see like three or four hands. Business, whatever business is. Yeah, business. And is, is, are there other things at Bentley? <laughs> English? Um, no? So it's business and tech. So I figured that much. Um, that's why I was here too, was to figure out why exactly um, where I wanted to go. And so I definitely think that that's something that you should be really thinking about um, is there's a lot of ways in which you can take what you learn here at Bentley um, and apply it differently. But technology is something that is going to be there for all of you um, in some way, shape, or, or form. And so, again, what I want to talk about is really how do you think about that framework for your own self. So before we get into it, um, I'd like to talk a bit about Akamai. So we power and protect life online. And our mission really is to make digital experiences fast, intelligent, and secure. Uh, our intelligent edge platform surrounds everything from the enterprise to the cloud. It keeps apps and experiences closer to users and attacks and threats far away. Make life better for billions of people, billions of times a day. This is our new headquarters, which we opened up just before COVID hit. <laughs> um, beautiful building. If you're ever down in, um, in um, Kendall Square, it, you got to go check it out. Um, Mark had brought, I think, a couple of students um, down to our NOC. We have a, a beautiful network operation and command center that's pretty, pretty impressive. So I'm just going to share a, a quick video. Business in the fast, vast, and volatile digital. I don't think we can hear it. Um, okay. Business in the fast, vast, and volatile digital world is anything but predictable. And with threats lurking just out of sight, your defenses must be ready for anything. Akamai is here to help. Backed by hundreds of expert threat researchers, Akamai analyzes 290 terabytes of attack data every day, turning it into built-in intelligence and automated protection against growing threats. From sneaky little phishing schemes to really, really big DDoS attacks, Akamai surrounds and protects your entire ecosystem. Your clouds, apps, APIs, and users to keep your business safe without slowing you down. Good defense. I don't know if you were able to hear that, <laughs> um, but you can, you can definitely um, get a sense, right, that, uh, just give me one second, I think I gotta go back into pre present mode. Um, you can you can get a sense that Akamai is much more than just security, much more than just being something behind um, some of the most popular websites that that you've been to. Um, so, 
Am I in presentation mode? Can you see this okay? Yeah. All right, great. Um, Akamai consists of uh, an intelligent edge platform. Um, we have a platform that consists of 350,000 servers, 1,700 networks, 4,100 locations, 137 countries. We're massively distributed all over the globe. Um, we accelerate traffic, uh, 40 million hits per second, 2 trillion deliveries per day, 50 terabytes per second. Um, you can see below the insights, 7.5 petabytes process per day. I think you get the idea. Um, huge, vast uh, network, um, incredible platform, um, delivering incredible capabilities to some of the, the uh, most well-known digital properties that you visit. Um, we have 9,000 people working at Akamai. Um, we have got 60 global offices and um, we have a number of 24 by 7 uh, operation control centers all over the world. Uh, we're trusted by a lot of different companies to power and protect um, the digital experiences for their customers. These are just a few of the names that you're familiar with. Uh, there are many other um, names as well um, that you know are, are not here but it's it, uh, it's a pretty massive um, amount of traffic that Akamai uh, is on the Akamai network every day. I want to tell you now with that context, my story. Um, so I'm a, an alumni from a university in Waltham that starts with a B, which is Brandeis. <laughs> That's where I went to my undergrad um, before I met before I met Mark and before I was on this uh, lovely campus and uh, a Bentley alum. And I was a psychology major. I studied psychology. I was fascinated with how human beings worked, and what motivated them and drove them. Um, I think Bentley does a really wonderful job, by the way, of sort of incorporating real world with education. Because when I got to my senior year at, at Brandeis, I actually was part of something called a clinical practicum. And I worked with um, an autistic child. And I said, you know what, I don't want to do this. <laughs> and that, that was after lots of money, um, lots of education. And I finally got an opportunity to, you know, practice it, what I thought I wanted to be. And I said, I don't want it. And so that was sent me down, uh, you know, uh, uh, the path that I went on. Um, after I graduated from college, I was working on Martha's Vineyard as a taxi driver, just just like you have summer jobs, that's what I did as a taxi driver. I happened to met, meet somebody and gave me his business card and he says he's a Wall Street broker and you should come work for me because of the service that I had provided. And I ended up going to Wall Street. I became a Series 7 rep and I was a stockbroker and a trader, it's a stock trader. And that also led me down to, hmm, maybe I don't wanna do this. But that experience allowed me to understand Wall Street, allowed me to understand what it means to work hard, understand how hard it is to sell and to market and to create value for people where people wanna give you money in order for the value that you provide. It is hard. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I ended up coming back to Waltham. I worked for a company that combined um, marketing, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, technology and finance. So I was working in the fintech industry, working for comp a company that essentially provided the back end software for a lot of the banks and, and brokerage firms. Um, and I was like, I love this. I love technology. Um, it was fascinating for me to be able to take my skill set and to apply it in this way. And that's when I decided to come back um, to Bentley, or to come back to school, I should say, and come to Bentley. And that's where I met Mark and other professors who really helped me appreciate technology. 
Um, after I graduated from Bentley, I ended up working for Gillette, which is now part of Procter & Gamble. And I was part of an IT um, leadership program where my, this was my essentially first job in technology. Every, it was a two year program. And every six months, I would go to a different job. So for the first six months, um, I worked um, on um, the public website, Gillette.com. All of the changes for Gillette.com, OralB.com, I was doing at that time. And again, um, you know, Mark, uh, it was very, very simple, simple um, software, right? It was simple uh, web pages. It wasn't as complex as it is today. I moved from there. I went into um, back end like ERP systems. I could go on and on. But at the end of the end of it, I got a really good experience of four different technical jobs. And I understand stood where I wanted to be. And I ended up implementing um, software um, CRM systems. And that's what I do today. So at that time, I was working with uh, software um, for people who went to stores like a Walmart and worked with Walmart to sell razor blades or Oral-B products or all of the different products that, that they serve and the software that was needed for that. After I was at, um, at, at Gillette, um, I, I left Procter & Gamble, bought Gillette. I left and I wound up at Akamai. And I've been at Akamai ever since. And I, like I said, I started as a business systems analyst. And the, what I do is I'm, as I mentioned before, that go between between business people who are trying to solve problems and engineers who are trying to solution for those problems and translating between the two because they don't speak each other's language. So you with me so far? Okay. Um, Mark had told me that that you know there that that many of you are what six are you six weeks into <laughs> coming your your first college experience? Awesome. Good for you. Um, is any of this resonating? Cool. Awesome. That's a question. Uh, no, so just join us. Okay. <laughs> So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I learned um, along the way. Um, coming, to, coming to Bentley, um, I was really thinking about, like, I like technology, but what do I do with it? Like, I was fascinated with programming. Mark, you know, sort of just I, it was, was found it fascinating. I was fascinated with database, uh, database technology. I just I was fascinated with it all, um, and and so I saw it as something that could solve problems very very easily, and that really was fascinating to me. When I got out into the real world. Uh, one of the things that became very, very clear is that technology is almost one of the last things that you should be thinking about. And this, this is where I want to sort of weave into this, the narrative, you know, how you all can start to expose yourselves to different um, um, experiences to see what works for you, what doesn't work for you so that you can start to think a, a bit more critically. And this is where my background, this background that doesn't seem like it fits at all with the story and what I do today, working with engineers, working with people who are very technical. My psychology background has played a huge role in how I think about technology and how I implement technology at, at Akamai and all of the companies that I've worked at before. What do I mean by that? The bottom line is that think about how many apps are on the App Store or on the Play Store. You have however many apps that are on your phone, right? Just because technology exists doesn't mean that you're just going to use it. 
you're using you know, the top five apps on your phone are because you're getting some sort of value out of it, some sort of benefit out of it. You know, who knows what, what that is? Is it just interactions, you know, pictures on Instagram, um, you know, just you know, being able to connect with people, seeing your bank account, um, seeing investments, whatever it may be. There's a reason that you do that. And so this is where the psychology comes into play. Something that you wouldn't think about, but something that's motivated me for a while is why do people do what they do? What drives people? And when you think about implementation of software, it's not so much about what's the best software, but it's about what's the software that people are gonna use and why are they gonna use it? And so the why, and that which was where, where we started at the beginning, asking why, why do you need this software? What is the value of it? Why, why do you think it's gonna solve your problem? Why do you not think that there's people or process that can help solve it? And so this is you know, kind of coming back to what, when you think about technology and you think about how it's gonna impact your life, it will out in whatever area you decide to go down in your you know, undergraduate degree, graduate degree, and out into the, into the quote unquote real world. People, process, and technology, that is what I've learned that people need to think about. And so when technology is a means, it's not an end. The end is what's the problem? What are you trying to achieve? Why are you trying to achieve it? Why do you use that app on your phone and not some other app, right? Understanding human behavior and how, what drives and what motivates people to do the things they do through technology. That is really key. And that is the role that I've played as a business systems analyst. And that is where I found my unique skill and my unique value, being curious of how the mind works. I thought I wanted to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I'm sort of a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but just in the business world. <laughs> People have problems. They're not mental problems. Sometimes those their business problems create mental problems, but I'm trying to solve business problems by the use of, of technology. Um, you feel free to turn it back on. I forgot to. I didn't. Oh, good. Awesome. <laughs> cool. So um, I have this screen. I love, I love this diagram. Um, it talks about like a capability. A capability really is culture, people, process, data, metrics, and technology. And so if you think you want to go down statistics route, there's a place for you. If you want to be a technologist, there's a place for you. If you want to understand process, you know, designing processes, there's a place for you. So I was going to go and talk a little bit about um, sort of what I do um, and give you a couple of use cases around how we implement um, software, but I'm going to change it up a little bit. Do people know what Salesforce is? No? Okay, great. So Salesforce is a customer relationship database. So it is one of the primary um, capabilities that we use for sales and marketers. Think about your phone, right? You've got your friends and family's contact information in your phone. You got names, you've got maybe birth dates, you've got addresses, You've got their phone numbers, you've got their email addresses in a contact record. That is Salesforce essentially, except it's a little bit more than that. It not only has the contacts that you wanna to sell to, but the accounts that they work for and the relationship between the two. You've got um, interest, what we call leads, and you've got, and so leads are where person A raises their hand and says, hey, I may be interested in your product or service. And so those are records within the customer relationship database. 
That is Salesforce. Does that make sense so far? It's a SaaS application. Do people know SaaS applications? No? So SaaS is software as a service. And so a lot of uh, companies like Akamai um, implement software where they're not maintaining the, the infrastructure of that software. So when I was talking about, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and, and the web servers that were delivering traffic, a comp many companies don't even, don't even care about that web server. They're outsourcing that to some other company, right? They just want to spin up um, a, a web content management system, create a web page using, you know, maybe configuration versus code, and be able to create that web page quickly without thinking about the underlying hardware and, and things like that. That's software as a service. You don't have to think about the software. The software is actually being upgraded and improved behind the scenes. Back in the old days, there was infrastructure that had to be created. Software had to be installed. Then there was an upgrade and you know you couldn't do anything on that software while people worked on the upgrade. Um, software as a service removes a lot of the complexity when we think about implementing software. And so this kind of goes back to what are the business problems? SaaS has allowed a lot of companies like Akamai to just focus in on what the business problem is. And you know, not a hundred percent, but you can pretty much solve those business problems relatively easily and relatively low cost. That's what SaaS does. Salesforce is just a, a, a one of many, many SaaS offerings that allow for a business to be able to spin up software, to spin up capabilities very effectively, efficiently, and with, in some cases, uh, you know, configuration as opposed to hardcore programming. That makes sense so far? Cool. Am I speaking their language? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so CRM. So it's a customer relationship database. Akamai, like a lot of other companies, actually work with partners. So partners sell on behalf of Akamai. Um, we also at our company have a partner relationship management system as well. So think about it. It's very similar to what I described, a database that has accounts, that has contacts that work for those accounts, that describe opportunities uh, where there could be business and storing all of the activity around those opportunities and those sales motions but very specific for partners who are working with our company to sell on behalf of our company. So a, a slightly different business problem. And what is interesting is they also need accounts. They also need contacts. They also need to develop demand for the product that they're selling. The the things that are actually different about the two are one, we have salespeople who work for Akamai who sell and they get paid by Akamai. Partners, on the other hand, they get only paid, they get paid when they sell Akamai. We're not paying them, they're partnering with us. And so think about that just for a moment. Think about the human nature, okay? If you're a partner, just like in when I was describing the iPhone example, right? You've got lots and lots of different applications on your phone. If you're a partner, you can partner with many different companies. Why would you partner with Akamai? What would motivate you to do that? Does anyone have any idea? From a technology perspective, it's ease of transaction, right? It's, can I go to, you know, the software, which is again, SaaS web-based. Can I log in easily? And is it clear on how to perform a transaction within your software? That's one of the calculus, if you will. Another would be, 
you know, how much are we paying them? But the point of this is that in technology, there's a psychology that needs to be applied because when you think about why people do the things that they do, you have to think about human nature. And so the technology you guys should learn as much as possible, as broad as possible. If you're going into business, you should be learning technology and business as broad as possible. And all of the learnings that you will have will come together in the right way at the right time for you to be valuable in, the, in, in whatever field you, you decide to go into. So this is really my last slide. How am I doing on time? Okay. All right. Um, I got a, a, a team and when I told them that um, I was coming here to, to present um, to mostly first year students, I said, what, what are the things that you would recommend? Um, these are people who have been in the workforce for a while. Some people recently got into the workforce. Some of them are in America. Some of them are in India. Um, and I thought I'd share some of these with you because I think it's really, really important. And again, I know some of you are going into the into business functions um, and some of you may go into technical functions, but this is really, I think, very important. We always look at basic coding and development skills when hiring, like data structures, algorithms, problem solving, which are not necessarily related to Salesforce development. But tells us individuals, but tells us an individual's understanding of development function, um, fundamentals. So you don't necessarily need to be a programmer if you don't want to be a programmer. But understanding programmatic concepts, data structures, algorithms, um, and, and and problem solving are really really key and will take you far. So continue to take courses like Mark's course and other. Um, professor's course, even if you're going to marketing, even if you're going to sales, even if you're going into, you know, where, where, whatever you are, um, where, wherever you go, it's very, very important and will will serve you well. Um, not only tech skills, but soft skills like communication, presentation, and critical thinking skills are also important. People process technology. Um, most of my time is asking why. Why do you need this software? Why, you know, problem is stated. Why is that a problem? Answer. Why is that your answer? <laughs> Understanding what motivates you, a, a human, into determining that software is the, is the thing that's going to solve their problem. And that's really important. Critical thinking skills. Um, for technologists, this one's a little bit more focused. Pet projects are really important as it allows you to learn 360 degrees in all essential skills, uh, especially if done with collaboration. And important is also important is not getting married to a particular platform or technology. Things change very quickly. So a lot of the, the work that I did at Bentley doing some of these creative projects with Mark and others, uh, working together in, in collaboration with other people, even though I didn't become a programmer or a database administrator or whatever it may be, served me well because I understood core concepts that I could use when I was out um, trying to provide value. Uh, Akamai, this one's a really important one. Um, and by the way, uh, the person who, who provided this one is also a Bentley grad. Um, at Akamai, we are a security company. Our customers expect us to keep their websites, apps, et cetera, secure. We hold our vendors to a similar standard, and they often balk at our level of security concern. We educate them on why it is criti so critically important. If you can go out in the world with a security mindset, you will not only improve yourself, but any company you work for will benefit from your thinking. I talked about SaaS software where you can just spin up software and spin up some other software and maybe have the two connect and spin up a third piece of software. If any one of those gets hacked, the whole thing comes down. And you could be a marketing technologist 
who said, hey, that's the latest and the greatest software. I need that. But if you don't have a security mindset, you could put your company at risk. That's what we do at Akamai. We do security really, 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 really well. And everybody at the company has a security mindset. You hear about hacks all the time. I'm sure your social media has been hacked over and over again, right? How do you prevent that from happening? Okay, so what? You know, they break into your social media account. Like, it's just, just you. What if you're the responsible one at your company for implementing software and the whole company's at risk? So security is really key and really fundamental. Um, I'd recommend first years to explore as many domains as possible, trying different technologies would help them in finding their niche early. It also it is also important to scrutinize the outcomes of their learning to perform better in the future. Moreover, try to connect with as many people as possible, set a goal, take guidance from professionals, and put in the effort. So again, very thematically, try to get as much exposure to technology if you're a technologist, but even if you're not. And then some basic coding skills should be beneficial, even for somebody that is choosing functional track. Critical thinking and decision-making skills are very, very valuable. So one of my first um, jobs when I was at Gillette um, in this rotation program, I actually programmed in Visual Basic, thanks to, to, to Mark in, in, an ex, in, in Excel, um, a, uh, it, was a, it was a, think of it as a report for project managers to um, think about the costing of their project. And so I was able to pro, you know, programmatically create something that was used across Gillette. Um, it was, you know, Excel, it was, you know, it was be a little bit before SAS, and it was used quite extensively across the company. That was something that was in a, a program management office. So definitely not a technology um, domain, but it was essential for me to be able to know programming at a very, very basic level for this particular role. And it served me well. And you never know where these skills are going to come up, where they're going to be used. But again, sort of the moral of, of my story to you is figure out what you're passionate about. Don't be afraid of leveraging that passion and trying to turn that passion into value for others. So that's it. Awesome. Let's take some questions from you guys and, and from anybody on Zoom. We'll start with you guys here in the room. And I'm also going to put up um, the, the slide. You can find it with the right. here. Is that? That one's yours, right? Yep, this one's mine. This one, if you want, um, we have a university relations uh, group at Akamai, and I'm not terribly familiar with this software, but if you check in, um, they'll know that you were at this event on this date, and it will basically, uh, as far as I know, send you emails, keep in touch with Akamai, um, and you can put your information in, and um, yeah, they'll be able to um, connect with you after this. So you can scan that if you want to keep in touch with Akamai. And um, I'm also going to put up on as soon as we stop you sharing. Uh, let's see. This one. So put it up there. So that's a QR code for the, you on, for people online and for people here um, to fill out regarding the this presentation, um, a lot of what we want you to learn at Bentley is soft skills, and Bentley is a program called Bentley Plus. You're probably going to learn about it in your FDS class. These topic and tech series are also part of that program because you can learn things about uh, critical thinking and communication and, and, other, and other things as well. So we're hoping that uh, you'll be able to answer the questions in the survey that's posted up there. But I also want to ask you to take any questions for Paul about his experiences or 
things you may have not realized that you learned today. Comments? If not, we have questions for you. So you guys go first, then we have, then we have questions for you if you have any questions for me. And if anybody has questions online, please raise your hand uh, and we'll uh, unmute and ask. Uh, I'm curious about the uh, how long your career did it take you to get to this point? Like, you never mentioned like, when you graduated. Like, how long did it take for you to like, go through all those different things? Like, yeah, all those different experiences? Um, so I would say that it took me, you know, understanding where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do um, probably took me about 10 years, 10 years since undergrad, undergrad. Um, that, you know, in there is when I went back to, to Bentley. Now, don't get me wrong, it was kind of like this, right? Um, when I graduated undergrad, I had a little bit of a crisis in that I just went to undergrad, got a great education, met a lot of smart people, um, but I was like, I don't know if I want to do what I studied. And it took a while to figure out what it is that made me happy like what I wanted to do as a career. Um, and I would say it took me about 10 years to wind up um, in the profession, in the niche of my profession that I am in now, if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, and I think as a general rule, you know, the tw like you're, when you're graduating, you're in your 20s. Your 20s are really, you know, don't put too much pressure on yourself in terms of trying to figure out like, you know, what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. You know, it's okay to experiment in that time. Your 30s, though, you should start to be thinking, okay, I kind of know what I want to do. I know what motivates me. And, you know, in your 40s, you're becoming a lot more um, of an expert. In your in whatever chosen profession, I mean, very very rough kind of guidelines there, but that's why I suggest to you is take the pressure off. I assume all of your parents are going, "What are you going to be?" Your friends are going to say, "What are you going to be? What are you going to do?" You know, you should be this, you should be that. I think you need to take a step back and learn as much as possible. Learn as much about yourself and try to be as well-rounded as you possibly can with technology, because technology will play a role in your life. It, it just depends on how much. And, you know, learning about that as early as possible is gonna be very valuable. So you can short, shortcut, uh, short circuit that 20, 30, 40 framework. <laughs> Other questions? Um, yeah. What are you working on today, like right now, in your work? Um, yeah, great, great question. Um, so, what's interesting is that um, at Akamai, we've done a lot of different projects where we've removed a lot of technical debt. So, when you work at a company like Akamai, that's a very, very engineering focused company, people believe you can solve problems with code and software. And so there was, you know, throughout my tenure at Akamai, there was a lot of homegrown software solutions at Akamai. And over time, those are slowly retired and replaced with, in some cases, best in class. Uh, software in in pockets, but there's always a little bit of infrastructure software that is called technical debt, right? That are around. There's reasons why they're around. There's a reason why they haven't been replaced. And so, to answer your question, what are we working on now? A lot of my career has been implementing these these this software, 
where we don't really have that much technical debt. We are actually um, operating with best-in-class software solutions. And so now we're able to say, okay, how do these things really um, enable our, so our sales and marketing organizations to solve the problems that they need to solve? Because tech technology is no longer an excuse. So technology can be an enabler, but it also can hold you back too if it's not implemented well. And so where we are in this journey is um, trying to enable self-service capabilities as one example. So when you think about, you know, person selling to you, and when you go in to buy a car, is it that human being interaction where all the paperwork needs to happen, right? The back and forth, the negotiation, or would you rather have the Amazon experience, right? Where you just go to, you know, or some, you, you name your commerce, you know, um, uh, solution where you're just finding the product, doing the research, going, yep, that's going to solve my problem and buying it. So now we're going more towards the latter. So that's one of the areas that we're working on. And so that's a hard problem to solve. Like to be like, I know who you are and I know what you want and I'm gonna make it so that it's easy to buy, to literally click something and buy it. That's hard uh, for a business to, uh, to do. Uh, that's one. Um, Akamai has also worked, uh, has, has acquired many other companies. And so some of the things that I do is to take um, those other companies and the infrastructure that they have to market and to sell and take those capabilities and bring them into our world. Sometimes it's um, removing those, those, that infrastructure and those capabilities because we no longer need it. We have a, you know, software X, they have software X. We don't need two software X, we just need one. And so sometimes it's removing the acquired company's software. Um, sometimes they have processes at that acquired company that are really innovative and really neat and something that we want to take advantage of. Sometimes it's taking those good ideas and implementing on our side. And so we have a number of acquisitions from other companies. So we're learning about how they've marketed and sold and the software that is there and bringing it into Akamai in a way that works for Akamai, but also works for the acquired company. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, it's 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 sort of interesting. We have a lot of uh, so there's a no one does exactly what Akamai does when you look at it in aggregate, but we do have a number of competitors in pockets. Um, this idea of um, security. There's lots of web security companies out there. Um, one of the other things I talked about, SaaS, software as a service. Um, Akamai can be thought of as something called infrastructure as a service. And so there's, um, you know, compute that you can purchase and access through the internet, essentially. You don't have to buy just like some physical hardware like this machine and you can actually access this compute power through the internet. Um, there's lots of other companies that, that do that as well. Um, when you think about the core kind of, you know, being delivering content in a secure way, in the way that Akamai does, um, there's not one competitor that does exactly what we do, but in these different differentiated pockets, there's a bunch of smaller competitors. I think um, we'll stick around if you want to talk some more, but I know that for many of you, if you have past 3.30, you have to get up the hill, so I'll make sure you have time to do that. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. Thank you for, all for coming down here. If you haven't yet done so, let me put my survey link at the bottom, that's back up on the screen. Please um, scan this and take it before you, before you go so that we can give you credit for being here and so we can hear about your experience while you're here. Um, thanks everybody for being here. And check out the CIS Sandbox website, cissandbox.com, where you can list, see the list of all the other presenters who are here also this one. Thanks everybody.